Giddy up. <clears throat> he won't go. I've been sitting here for two hours. I'm thirsty, and there's sand and everything I own. <coughs> this is the last time I let you plan our vacation. Dear Tim and Moby, can you tell me about the Silk Road? Thanks, Sunny. Sure, Moby and I are lost somewhere on it right now. Of course, Silk Road is kind of a misleading term. It wasn't a single road, but a network of ancient trading routes connecting East Asia to the Mediterranean. There was even a maritime Silk Road covering the same area by sea. And it wasn't just about silk. Spices, precious metals, art, and pretty much anything else of value were traded on these routes. Overland, the Silk Road covered more than 6,000 kilometers and brought together cultures that had never interacted before. Very old. Some sections of the road date back more than 5,000 years. These were mainly shorter trading routes that developed between neighboring tribes. Over time, powerful empires filled the gaps between these unrelated roads. In the 4th century BCE, the Greek conqueror Alexander the Great pushed east into Central Asia. About 200 years later, China's Han Dynasty expanded its influence westward. Chinese merchants exported silk to the new territories. Yeah, that's why we call it the Silk Road now. Nobody back then referred to it that way. Anyway, by the 1st century BCE, the silk routes were stable enough for goods to travel from China all the way to Europe. Around this time, silk made a huge splash in Rome. Fashionable Romans couldn't get enough of the luxurious new material. Meanwhile, all kinds of Western goods, from glass to gold to garlic, began arriving in China. No, merchants didn't travel all the way from Rome to China or vice versa. That's thousands of kilometers over some of the harshest mountain and desert terrain on the planet. On top of these natural dangers, bandits were everywhere waiting to steal, kidnap, and even worse. In fact, parts of the Great Wall of China were built to protect Silk Road traders. To stay safe, they traveled in caravans, groups of traders going in the same direction. Camels were the pack animal of choice because they could withstand extreme heat and cold and go a long time without water. All along the Silk Road, traders would stop and rest at oases, areas with water and vegetation. Many of these stops grew into trading centers and even major cities. Merchants would travel back and forth between cities loaded with goods each way. Well, for instance, you might haul Indian spices from Bactra to Merv. In Merv, you'd sell your spices and buy, say, jewelry from a gold merchant. Another trader might take your spice farther west, and you'd take the gold back east. This way, goods could move down the Silk Road, city to city, trader to trader, across entire continents. Merchants and other travelers exchanged customs and ideas, too. Greek math and philosophy found their way into Asia. Buddhist monks spread their beliefs north and east from India. And the religion of Islam moved east and west out of the Arabian Peninsula. Well, there had to be peace and stability for everything to work properly, so over the centuries, a network of empires provided security. The gigantic Mongol Empire was the last to keep the overland route safe, but it began to fall apart around 1300. That wasn't a huge deal. The sea routes were able to pick up the slack. But starting in the 15th century, European explorers began finding direct paths to Asia that were safer and cheaper. These new routes made the Silk Road pretty much obsolete. Oh yeah, it was much more than just a trade route. The Silk Road began a cultural exchange on a level that had never been seen before. In fact, some historians call it the first example of globalization. Great, our camels ran away. Now we've really had it. A caravan coming this way? We're saved! Not exactly what I had in mind, but 